All right, welcome everybody to Finance 443, this Super Tuesday, Super Voting Tuesday. Um, special edition, final week of 443. Congratulations, you made it to the final week. Hopefully, uh, you've seen my notes to this point. I've posted information about the learning coach for this week, if any of you would like to use that resource. I've also uh, posted a little note about the week two test, which I think will be good news uh, for most all of you. Uh, many of you struggled with the week two test. Most of you did uh, on a percentage basis better on the week three test and did okay on the week one test. So uh, I was able to, to curve somewhat that week two test based on the average score. And so that should be good news for, for many of you. Anyway, so that's last week. Uh, if you're still finding yourself behind on your work, uh, be sure to get it in, right? We've just got this week, Saturday at midnight's the hard cutoff. So if you find yourself missing a, a paper or missing, you know, some posts on the discussion board, something like that, get it in right away. And uh, so I can give you some points and you can see what you're going to be getting from the course. If you have turned everything in and find yourself behind the eight ball as far as the score, a score that's not what you were trying to go for and you've done your best and you've turned everything in, uh, zip me a quick email and let's talk about it. Uh, that would, it would be necessary for you to accomplish the final test though earlier on this week so that we have time to communicate back and forth about opportunities to, to perhaps improve your score. Okay. If you're taking the test at 10 o'clock on Saturday, this coming Saturday night, and then you email me about opportunities, you know, for, to potentially help your score, I'm not going to be able to respond in time. We're not going to have time to be able to look at that. So if it's your intention for you and I to discuss, uh, how you could potentially increase your score, I would strongly encourage you to take the exam Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, one of those days earlier, the better so that we have plenty of time to discuss what you can do to improve. Okay. All right. So get that out of the way. Any questions or concerns about the coursework to this point? We were talking, uh, Michelle, Jack and I a little bit before we came online as far as the recording about the course evaluations and about this business integration survey or this course integration survey. Um, I've got some feedback that I can give back to the school. They, of course, format that. And they want it to be consistent from class to class. So uh, I can give some feedback, but you know that's something that, that folks who have power have, have decided in back rooms. And hopefully they'd listen to our feedback, but who knows, right? So I think it's a good idea, as you mentioned, Michelle, to maybe do it a little bit later in the week as far as the, the discussion board comments so that you can have it, you know, when the course is actually over. Um, and then as far as the integration, you know, survey, I, I don't know what their intention is there. It's too new for me to even be able to assess what they're trying to accomplish there. So uh, I, I wish I had better feedback than that. It's, it's like I say, something newer that I'm, yeah, I just don't know what their intention or perspective was. <laughs> Pretty sure they have a good idea. I'm just not privy. I'm not in those rooms where they make those decisions. That 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 those aren't professors making those decisions. Those are, you know, deans and supervisors and things like that. So, anyway, all right. So a couple of things we need to accomplish tonight. We need to do a quick review, chapters 10 through 14. And I say 10 through 14. There's a little bit of a glitch, I think, in Investopedia. Maybe it's just one of the browsers I was using. But it seems like when you go to the course. Uh, text for uh, the chapters associated with the Series 7 test in, on Investopedia. Uh, it shows Chapter 14. It shows that it goes through Chapter 14, but then when you click on, I think it's like 12 through 14 or 13 and 14 or something like that, it only shows, at least on my latest, when I brought it up earlier today, it only shows going through Chapter 13. If you scroll through the outline, though, it shows like 13.2, and I'm pretty sure that that's what we're referring to as 14. Okay, you'll, you'll know when you look at it, investopedia.com, when you're looking up the coursework, the course outline, and you're reading through the different course outline material um, segments, you know, where they have a few, a few paragraphs basically about each one of the outline bullet points. Um, they've got different chapters assigned to that. There's a link to it in the week four readings and tools for week four. But anyway, when you're there, don't be alarmed if you can't fi find chapter 14 or a heading for chapter 14. It, it appears to me that it's just the second part, it's split into two parts of chapter 13 instead of, uh, instead of chapter 14. Okay. Maybe it'll make more sense when you're looking at it, but, but just know that it might be a little bit confusing. You might not find a chapter 14. It might just be the second half of chapter 13. 
Michelle, I've got bad news for you. They're definitely matching questions on this week's final. I mentioned to you after week two that the final would be more similar to the week two test, which I'm sure makes a lot of you uh, alarmed uh, as far as how difficult that week two test was. But it should have been a learning you know, situation where you come out of week two knowing better maybe how to prepare for that instead of reading the glossary and just thinking that it's going to be word for word matching. It might be better to study some of the terms that I'll give you tonight that will be on the test more than just memorizing a quick definition or trying to gather the definition from a from something that you really don't understand the concept on. Uh, we want to be able to understand the concepts and use the material. Those two things in conjunction with one another will, will help you out a lot. <laughs> uh, no. So anyway, um, there will be a, a 58 questions on the test. We're going to spend more than half of the class tonight going through the topics and information you need to know for the test. Um, just be aware, though, with 58 questions and some matching, you need to leave yourself plenty of time for the, the test this week. I would leave yourself at least two hours. And I know that your lives are busy, and I know that sounds crazy, but this is a final exam in a college course. Uh, Setting aside two or three hours for a final exam when there's no other coursework this week is not too much to ask, but it is, it is uh, unrealistic if you only give yourself 20 or 30 minutes to take this test or if you have a lot of interruptions, it's unrealistic to expect a good grade. This is going to be a test that you need to you know, really a lot time, be in a comfortable place that you can focus that's quiet without disruption and, and really give it the time that you need. Okay, and then the other piece, and, and we'll talk about this more in just a little while, but the other piece that you, that you all can do is take a few notes from tonight as far as the topics that you'll need to know and pre-study, right? Don't just go into the test thinking, well, I'll just find this material on Investopedia. That's where we run into problems, especially with the matching and definition parts, but also with the other questions, because if we do that, we end up trying to extrapolate information from, from a text, right, without really knowing what the concept really means anything about the concept and when we do that we always risk getting the answer ro wrong the test questions are meant to be a situation where they're testing your understanding right not not your ability to just go find an answer in a text it's testing understanding and and and, and knowledge and so that takes it kind of a kind of to a, to a higher level right we've got to we've got to go in and put in some some effort and time before we get to the test i think this is just me, you know, suggesting this. I think before you get to the test, you go through the different things that I tell you that are going to be on there tonight, the different notes that you've taken, and read up on those different topics before you get to the test. And then use the test time for, you know, finding more information that you just didn't get from tonight's, tonight's lecture, which hopefully will be limited, but there probably always are a few questions that you just didn't jot down, didn't get the note on, or just studied the wrong thing for a little bit, and then you'll need to go back and use some time for that. Okay. All right. Now that I've scared you sufficiently about the test, we're going to cover more information on it. I'm going to give you a lot more specifics on it. Don't stress out about it. One of the things that, that prevents a lot of people from doing well on a test is just how much stress and anxiety they feel about test taking, especially when they think it's going to be a really hard test. My point in, in telling you that I think it's going to be a long test is not to tell you that, not to stress you out and make you feel like it's going to be a really, really tough test. The point in telling you that is so that you'll prepare, right? Give yourself enough time and prepare adequately. Don't just wing it, you know, 30 minutes before midnight on Saturday, or it will be a challenging test and you probably will not score the test score that you were, that you were hoping for. Okay, so that's a little bit of a preview there. Um, so what we need to accomplish first is a review, chapters 10 through 14. I've got a few slides just to quickly review some of the, the main points that we've already talked about in previous weeks, but just to... to to um, reconsider them briefly, some some of the main points that we've covered. Uh, I find if you know that that repetition sometimes really brings it home, especially if if you've heard it in the lecture, you've been tested over it, you've written a paper you know on it, you've done discussion board comments on it, and then we talk about it one more time here to wrap up. I find that that's a really good way to 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 really internalize the concepts. But we'll, we'll zip through that. We've just got to zip through kind of that review of the main concepts that we've covered in order to, like I say, get to the, the end of the course or the end of the class tonight, excuse me, where we, can, where we can really dig in on the topics that you'll need to know for the test and give you some notes for that. Okay? All right. Before we get started, any questions, concerns? Anything we need to cover before we get into review material? 
Okay, so our slides moving tonight. <laughs> this is pretty pathetic that I have to ask that, but but slides are moving. Okay, so we've got from chapter ten. Okay, so this final test is for chapters ten through fourteen. It's the review material for the series seven test on Investopedia.com. So we talked about in a previous week customer objectives and how as a financial advisor, one of the main roles of a financial advisor is to assess suitability, what's referred to as suitability. And how do we assess suitability? What would be suitable as far as products or services that we're going to offer? The way we do that is to ask a lot of questions, right? To have a good conversation with a lot of questions to find out and assess adequately uh, the situation that the person's in so that we can then give advice that's, that really is truly suitable and applicable to the situation that we're dealing with. Remember, in a previous week, we talked about the fact that if somebody does not do that with you as a consumer of financial products, then you should go find somebody else because that's just vanilla ABCs of investment management or financial advisory services. They've, they've got to be good at assessing the information and finding out as much as they need to know or as much as they can find out in order to truly give good advice. Okay, that, that is applicable to your situation, not just a sales job. Uh, in my business as a financial advisor, we really have got to look at it as a, as a fact-finding educational experience where we demonstrate and show options and explain options and educate about options and then allow the consumer to, to be a consumer and choose the best thing that's in their best interest. Okay, All along, giving them advice, giving them you know, some direction and coaching and guidance but really that education part, that fact-finding part's gotta be part of the, of the formula as well, I think, okay? And as far as the Series 7 test is concerned, FINRA is concerned, the, the regulator, that's, that's what it should be. It should be a situation where you're trying to educate and inform after you've taken the time to really fact-find and find out the information that you didn't know in order to, be, to, to um, sell something suitable. If you violate the rule of suitability in, in the business of advisory servicing, of services and investments, you, you stand to either be you know, um, kicked out of the business or, or you know, other, some other kind of sanction or, or, or restriction as far as your licensing is concerned, okay? So it's serious business. Now, how do you find out that information? Obviously, you, you assess, as we've talked about, by using a lot of different questions. We, we talk about financial questions. The, the Series 7 material talks about looking at somebody's balance sheet and income statement, their personal balance sheet and income statement. So inflows, outflows as far as income and expenses month to month, and then also their assets and liabilities, right? So this, this has some crossover with corporate finance in that we're finding out somebody's financial statements and a and little different than businesses, a lot of times businesses just know those right offhand, right? They're, they're right on top of them. A lot of times for individuals, they, they really don't know very well what their net worth is, you know, their assets and liabilities. You can kind of create it with them and, and put it together. But some people just really don't keep a budget, don't know their income and expenses. They just spend the money that they make, right? And some people really don't know as far as their assets and, and, and liabilities. They don't really worry about it. Uh, but those are both important things uh, to consider you know, as far as the financials that you're dealing with before you start to advise or, or give suggestions uh, for products. Of course, and we talked about this, that there are non-financial issues as well. This has to do with like risk tolerance and goals. Very important to find out how much risk somebody is willing to take and something that is not taken very seriously uh, from you know, an industry standpoint. A lot of people just kind of come up with somebody's risk tolerance. It's really important to have this discussion with a client and really dig down on how much risk truly a client is willing to take. And we talked about in a previous week that sometimes it's pretty hard to, to assess. People really don't know. They, they might call themselves aggressive or conservative, but really they don't even know what that means relative to the business. And so it's important once again to kind of have an educational experience where you kind of think through and talk through and help somebody really truly consider their risk tolerance. Same with their goals, you know, as far as their objectives. And finally, when you've gotten through all those questions, then you can kind of assess, as we've talked about before, the truly the right products for that person. Now, why all the questions? Once again, it comes down to suitability. Both legally, it's mandatory, but much more important than that, as an advisor, morally, okay, ethically, you need to be finding out enough information so that you can truly uh, do what's in the best interest of your customer. 
Okay, and and so we go through this, and it's important for the Series Seven test, but but perhaps more important for participants in a course like this who may never become a financial advisor. That might not be your, you know, you might not aspire at all to be a financial advisor. But it's important to consider these issues as, from a standpoint of being a consumer, like we've talked about before, being a customer or consumer of any financial product, insurance, investments, retirement, whatever it is, financial planning. Uh, all the way down the list, those are all financial products, and somebody should be following the, this type of model in order to give you good advice and suitable advice for your situation. Okay? Any questions on customer objectives or Chapter 10? Kind of the main points from Chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really just about making sure you do the right thing for the customer, and the way to do the right thing for the customer is to, to make sure that you understand their situation uh, so that you can. All right, so then we get to Chapter 11. Chapter 11 is about portfolio management. We talked, you'll recall, about the monetarist theory and Keynesian theory, monetarist theory being uh, control based on money supply, okay? Really has to do more with the Fed and how the Fed controls the money supply. And then Keynesian policy has more to do with spending and specifically, usually, government spending. So if, if government increases taxes or increases spending, Keynesians would say that that's the most important thing to determine uh, whether or not an, econ an economy will, will expand or contract. Uh, monetarists would say, no, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the money supply, where interest rates are at, and how much money supply is out there. Okay? So those are your two theories there. Then we talked about e economic indicators like housing starts. And we talked about unemployment, how it's a lagging indicator, and then you have leading indicators. And I, and I asked you to look through the text a little bit last week and make sure you are comfortable with those two, at least, and, and different indicators that the text talks about in Investopedia. So those are indicators. Then we talked about how important the Fed is, right? We talked about how the Federal Reserve Board, and Janet Yellen is the Fed chairwoman, has perhaps the most significant power economically in the world. Uh, as far as controlling the money supply to the United States, but it, but really, that is a is a lead or a tell for the rest of the world on how the economy is going because the U.S. is the largest economy, and really a lot of economies around the world get their get their cue from whatever the U.S. does. That's why globally the world watches what Janet Yellen does and what the Federal Reserve Board does very very closely. Okay, and it has a significant impact on the rest of the world. So we talked about how important the Fed is. We talked about how federalreserve.gov is a great site with lots of free information about the economy. And that's, of course, information that, that they gather anyway in order to, to create policy there. We, I don't think we covered technical versus fundamental analysis or looking at bond, stock, and mutual fund analysis. Basically, what all we're talking about here is ways to evaluate the value, okay, to evaluate the worth um, of some kind of investment, okay? That's, that's analysis in the investment world is just trying to evaluate what the true value of something is. Why do we care? Because we want to see if we're getting a good deal or a bad deal on our investment. We want to assess that before we move forward buying an investment, right? It's a, it's a, it would be a bad choice to purchase something that you've evaluated and decided is overpriced. That'd be like going to the store and saying, okay, you know, I know bread should be $2 a loaf, but it's $5. I think I'll definitely buy it at $5 a loaf. Um, you know, that's not rational at all. That's not, that's not a good plan at all. Now we go to the store and if, if a loaf of bread's on sale for 99 cents, we say, yeah, that's a great deal. Let's get two. Or if it's just regular price, it's two bucks a loaf. We don't even think about it. We just grab it. Right. And I know that's a little bit oversimplified because I think a lot of people, um, you know, don't really think about that. And that's, kind of a problem with how we spend money. <laughs> Michelle, I think you're exactly right. I think a lot of people don't worry about whatever they're buying, right? The next car, the next house, whatever it is they're buying, they don't even think about it. They just, if they can afford it, they buy it. They don't really think about the true value of it and whether or not they're overpaying or not, which is when it comes to investing, as you can imagine, oh, you, we don't ever want to have to overpay for anything. Um, I was talking to a client earlier today out in the basin, he lives out in Vernal, and they were talking about how they bought a, a piece of rental property about three years ago and they overpaid by about $100,000. If they were to try to sell that property today, it would be $100,000 less than what they paid for it. And, and for them, that's devastating, right? I mean, they just, they are just really heartbroken and sick about the fact that they paid so much. Um, 
I, I just, yeah, I mean, I'm listening to this person talk about it and I'm like, well, you know, why would you have overpaid like that? I mean, it doesn't make any sense other than you just kind of got caught up in the moment, made a poor decision and then, uh, and then made a big mistake. Uh, you're right, Jack. I, I don't know if you've been out there or, or are familiar with the basin, but it's, it's, they're in recession out there. I mean, it's bad uh, because of how low oil prices are right now. It's tough. I was just out there last Thursday and Friday. So, yeah, and they did put some money into it, and it just, yeah, now they can't even find renters for it. There's The rental market's horrible out there because it got overbuilt. So it's just a really, really bad deal for them. But But the point being, any kind of investment that we make, one of the roles of our investment advisor should be to advise us on whether or not we're paying a fair price for it or whether or not we're getting a good deal or whether or not we're overpaying. And Jack, I completely agree. We can overpay for things and time will usually heal that, right? It'll usually make it right. But in some cases it doesn't. I mean, if we overpay, for example, if we bought Walmart stock six months ago or a year ago when you're a hundred bucks a share and now we're at $65, $70 a share, it might take us years and years and years for that to come back. So why buy when it's high when, when we can find something potentially that it's lower? So what does it mean to analyze a stock, a bond, or a mutual fund? It just means that we analyze the value and, and try to find out whether or not we're getting a good deal or not. So when we talk about technical versus fundamental analysis, technical analysis is when we evaluate the momentum, the direction, so another way of, of thinking about a technical analyst is somebody who looks at the charts, right? Somebody who looks at a chart for an investment decides whether or not there's momentum. And if there's momentum, they buy. And if there's, if there's a deceleration in, in people buying, then they sell, okay? These are people who study charts and try to invest based on those charts. And some of them are very successful. Having said that, the most successful investor in the world is Warren Buffett. And he's what we refer to as a fundamental investor who evaluates companies and tries to determine for that company whether or not that company is a good value or not. Okay, that's considered fundamental analysis. And you look, of course, at financial issues and non-financial issues alike to try to assess your best guess on whether or not you're getting a good deal or not. Yeah, Michelle, <laughs> lots of fraud. I mean, I if you look at, it, you know, there are, seems like there are specials every other week on people burning their house down or, you know, getting in an accident on purpose, just all kinds of weird stuff. You know, uh, social security and disability fraud is rampant. Uh, food stamps fraud, you know, there's just all kinds of fraud all over, you know, where people are trying to, you know, cut through the system a little bit in order to get ahead. So I agree. So technical uh, analysis, like I say, is a chart watching charts, fundamental analysis is digging into the financials and trying to find out whether or not it's a good value or not. We did talk about, I remember uh, specifically talking about business cycles. Recall how we talked about contractions and expansion periods and then how we talked about peaks and troughs. You want to know all four of those, um, you know, as far as business cycles and what they all mean. And then how, and then remember we talked about how these cycles go, go repeat themselves over and over and over again. We don't know how long periods of expansion and, and contraction will be, but we do know that we're going to see different periods at different times uh, in the future, just like we have in the past, right? That's a cycle that repeats itself over and over again. And then in chapter, in this chapter, there's a couple issues on it, on basic accounting. So when you're evaluating or analyzing an, an investment, one of the things that you need to have a basic understanding about is being able to read a financial statement like an income statement or an, a balance sheet. And one of the critical issues associated with how a company values their assets is the concept of depreciation and then the concept of um, inventory management and inventory valuations, which that has to do with last in, first out, first in, first out accounting. Okay, I'm not gonna go into this in great deal. We don't have a lot of time tonight, but just know that these are concepts that the book thought you should know from chapter seven. Uh, depreciations when we take an asset and we depreciate it over time. For example, if I have a piece of equipment that I bought for a million dollars as a, as a physician, every year that I use that piece of equipment, it depreciates, okay? And on my taxes, I'm allowed to depreciate some of the value of that piece of equipment because over time, it's gonna become less valuable, right? Any piece of equipment becomes more valuable the more, or less valuable, excuse me, the more I use it. The term for that is depreciation, and, I, and I'm able to depreciate on my taxes and write off that decrease in value each year 
uh, on my taxes. So it gives me an, uh, a benefit um, as I depreciate it. Now, if I were to go and sell it, then there's what's called depreciation recapture if I sell it for more than what I've depreciated it down to, okay? So if I took that million dollar piece of equipment and I've depreciated it down to 500,000 so I could write a bunch off on my taxes, and then the next year I go and sell it for 800,000, I'm gonna realize a $300,000 gain, even though I sold it for less than what I originally bought it for. So depreciation can come back and bite you a little bit. This is another issue with rental properties. A lot of people will very aggressively depreciate their property, and then when they go to sell, they're very surprised by the fact that they have to recapture all that depreciation when they go and sell it, okay? So just something to keep in mind, depreciation. And then the concept of LIFO and FIFO is, like I say, in a, in a accounting issue as it pertains to inventory management. So when I'm selling inventory, if I, if I own a Target store, right, which this is oversimplified, but if I own Target, okay, and I, which would be really cool, by the way, I'd be making good money. But if I own Target and I'm selling products, I can either account for those products like they're the ones I just barely purchased, or I can account for them like they're the ones I purchased at the very beginning. And, and so the government doesn't require companies to actually identify when they bought a product. They just require them to account for all of it being sold at some point using one of the methods that they allow, LIFO, FIFO, or specific product accounting. Okay. So that's probably too little information to really, you know, to really understand that concept very well. But know that they, the, the test is interested in us understanding, or the book is interested in us understanding basic LIFO and FIFO concepts. Okay, then we get into the next chapter on risk and taxation. We talked a little bit about the risks. We did not get it, we were not able to get into much about taxes. Um, let me just quickly remind you that there were a lot of different risk factors that the book, uh, that the book, the text talked about on Investopedia. I would review those. I've, I've included some in here that Investopedia doesn't even probably, you know, have because I think they're, they're risks that I talk to my clients a lot about. Some of the risks that Investopedia and the test talk about are kind of more obscure. They're not ones that are, that are as common. Um, and I was going to talk about a little bit, but we're running out of time before I need to get to test materials. So just know that you'll want to know the Investopedia risk factors that they list, um, you know, before you get to the test. And then know that there will be probably a few questions on the test about taxation that is covered. So with investments, you've got taxation. It can be either short-term or long-term, ST or LT. Short-term is an investment that you've held for less than 12 months then you get short-term capital gains and you're taxed at your normal income tax rate, which could be as high as 49%. Long-term capital gains are usually taxed at the long-term capital gains tax rate, which is 15%, unless you're wealthy, unless you're really affluent, then it's a 20%, or if you're really poor, it's, a, it's at zero actually. So if you sell a house and have a capital gain, but you don't make any money, there's a good chance that you might not have to pay any taxes on that. If you're affluent, it might be a situation that you have to, to pay quite a bit. Okay. So a um, couple, couple things to consider when it comes to investing. First of all, if it's a month 11 and you're about to sell an investment, you might want to strongly consider just holding it to month 12, right? So you can get long-term capital gains instead of short-term capital gains. Something very important just to always consider when it comes to um, when it comes to investing in anything. That, that could be artwork, that could be a classic car, that could be gold or silver. Doesn't matter what I'm investing in, all of those investments apply, short-term or, or long-term, depending on whether or not it's under 12 months or over 12 months. And that could make a substantial difference on how much tax I have to pay. Now, dividends are a little bit different. When it comes to investments, the dividends and interest we receive is usually taxable at income tax rates, okay? So if I buy some bonds or if I buy something that pays me a dividend, usually I'm going to pay, um, you know, just I'm going to pay my, my normal income tax rate on those dividends. Like if I have a CD, right, through the bank and they pay me interest, which most CDs do, um, I'm going to pay at the end of the year, I'm going to get a 1099 from the bank and I'm going to have to pay taxes on the interest that I receive from that CD, okay? Same thing is true for an, any kind of investment that pays interest or dividends. I'm going to pay taxes on those dividends. And then one exception that's, that's very important when it comes to 
uh, when it comes to taxation of, of investments is municipal bonds. And the reason this is an exception is because municipal bonds pay tax-free dividends. Okay, Why do they pay tax-free dividends? Because the federal government is going to give us a break on our taxes if we're willing to support our local government. So cities, counties, and states issue dividends right on their debt if we buy their bonds and those dividends come to us federal tax free so one of the one of the biggest benefits uh, to municipal bonds is the fact that they pay tax free they usually learn earn less interest you're right jack um, usually they earn less um, but they actually earn more for folks who pay really high tax right so if I, if I make like 3% on a municipal bond, but I'm in a, like a 45% tax bracket, really I'm getting more like 4.5-5% on that money, right, after tax. So the, the, uh, the equivalent on the taxable bond side would be like 1.5%, 2% more. If I am in a low tax bracket, then it's not nearly as good of a benefit, right? So... Municipal bonds are very popular with affluent people, right? They're looking for any opportunity possible to avoid taxation. So I bet if we were to look at, uh, you know, Mitt Romney's taxes, okay, he would be reporting that some of his income comes through as tax-free income. And how does he get that? Because he's invested in some municipal bonds to avoid taxation, okay? And basically that's a way, like I say, for us to support or sponsor local community construction and development. So our local governments will issue bonds to, to build schools, to build power plants, to build museums, to build conference centers. Those bonds are what you and I buy and support our local communities, and that's where we get paid back interest uh, over time. Okay, so whenever you go to the poll, you know, speaking of Super Tuesday, right, and, and, and politics, seems like every fall when you go to vote, if you do, you'll see some kind of bond election, right? Uh, a bond, yes or no to a bond. And usually what those are is some kind of project that the, the local government, either city or county, has to ask our permission for to do. And if we say yes to it, that means that they can issue debt. They can, they can have people invest in their debt, and then they'll be paying them tax-free interest over time. That's what a municipal bond is. Okay? So it can be an advantage for the affluent. Like you say, Jack, it also pays less interest, though. So if you're not in a high tax bracket, it probably doesn't make sense to, to do those. Okay. I think this is one of our last ones. I think this is Chapter 13. We've got rules and regulations in Chapter 13. Talks about primary and secondary markets. When it comes to the stock market, the primary market is where we issue new stock. The secondary market is where we trade it amongst each other. So if I were to ask where do new stocks issue new stock, so years ago when Google became IPO'd, had an initial public offering, what market was that in? You could say it was in the primary market because that's where stocks IPO or initial public off, have an initial public offering. That's when the money goes to the company and to the owners of the company. After the initial public offering, when I buy Walmart stock, nobody at Walmart gets that money. I'm buying it from somebody else who already owns Walmart stock, right? That's why we talk it. That's why we refer to it as stock trading, because I'm buying it from somebody else that already owns the stock. I'm not buying it from Walmart, the company. I'm buying it from Joe. I own Walmart stock, and I'm buying it from him. Okay. So that's the secondary market. The secondary market is like the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq where we're buying and selling stocks amongst each other. The primary market is where a company issues stock for the first time. That's where they get paid initially to raise capital and to, to grow their businesses. Okay, so that's primary versus secondary. We've talked about the Securities and Exchange Act of 1933 and 34. I'm not going to talk about it now. Just know that the test probably will refer to those. SIPC is the fraud insurance on investments covers up to $500,000 if something fraudulent were to happen on an account. Interestingly, Bernie Madoff did have SIPC. The problem was so many people invested millions and millions of dollars that getting covered at $500,000 did not really help them, right? They'll take anything, and it's nice to have that much coverage, but if you invested $50 million with Bernie and he lost everything but $500,000, that you're, you're still broke, right? So it was the fact that he had such high investors 
high value investors that really was the was the issue. If everybody was under five hundred thousand, they would have all been covered because he did have SIPC insurance. Interestingly enough, uh, FDIC is of course the bank side insurance only covers depository accounts like bank like checking, savings, and CDs. It covers up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars per registration, and it protects if the bank goes out of business. Right. So that's where the government comes in and writes checks if, if a bank goes out of business. And a, hundreds of banks went out of business in 2009. And so FDIC had to come in and actually write those checks and make people whole. Okay, that's on the bank side, but only on bank products, not, not on investment products, just on bank products. And then we talked a little bit about SROs, which are self-regulating organizations, self-regulatory organizations like FINRA. FINRA is made up of, of industry professionals that help to regulate themselves and help come up with best practices and rules uh, underneath the jurisdiction of, of the Securities and Exchange Commission, of course, the SEC. Okay, I don't really have much more time to cover on that. Uh, and then I think chapter 14, like I say, there's a little bit of a glitch on Investopedia this morning, but I think chapter 14 has to do with registration requirements for being in the investment world. If you're going to sell any kind of investment, technically you should be registered. And in order to be registered, you have to take a test. And if you're going to take a test like the Series 6 or Series 7 test, you got to study and, and pay, a, 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 you know, pay a fee. And you've got to have somebody that sponsors you, a company that's going to sponsor you into it. Can't just do it on your own. I mean, there's a lot of rules and hoops to jump through to make sure that there's regulation in place. Uh, and that's the registration process. So initially, you pay a, you pay a fee. You take a test and you get sponsored by somebody. That's the initial requirement to be registered. And then on an ongoing basis, you have continuing education or CE credits that you have to keep up to date and you have to pay relicensing fees and make sure to maintain your sponsorship. If you get fired by whoever sponsored you, you know, whatever company sponsored you, you, your registration will go away unless you hang your hat somewhere else or hang your registration somewhere else. You have to always be sponsored. That's the way that FINRA and the SEC can basically, um, basically more easily regulate you as if there's somebody tracking what you're doing, right? That's why you have to have a sponsorship of a company or firm behind you, okay? All right, sorry. We had to go pretty fast through that, the, the last part there. Um, I did want to make sure that we covered uh, like I say, had enough time for the, the final exam because obviously that's, that's the biggest part that we need to prepare for tonight. We've covered a lot of the material that will be on, but I need to give you some notes on, on what's going to be there. There are 58 questions I told you uh, earlier. I've already given you kind of that update. Here's the link to the Investopedia site where it shows you chapters 10 through 14, and you just can click through and read through them. If it were me, and you don't have to do this, but if it were me before I took the test, I would read through Every one of those segments, they're only a couple paragraphs long, each one of the outline bullet points for each one of the chapters. It might take you an hour or two, um, but I think it'd be well worth your time to kind of read through those and familiarize yourself with that information before you get to the test. Um, I, I've put a note here because of how, you know, we struggled with it in the week two test. Rewording on definitions is going to catch you off again on this one if, if we don't learn more than just the exact word for word definition. Okay, we've got we to understand a concept. We can't just memorize a definition or try to find a def definition. Um, and then finally, like I mentioned before, just give yourself plenty of time, right? You gotta give yourself plenty of time. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you cut yourself short on the time or have a lot of interruptions or, or, or distractions, there's nothing I can do to help you if that's the case. You've gotta have enough time and plenty of time in, in particular for this test without distractions or problems, you know, so that you can really focus on it and do the best you can. Okay, so what is going to be on the test? Number one on the test, you're going to need to know the definitions of cash, margin, and options. So if I have a brokerage investment account, what does it mean to have cash investments, margin investments, and option investments? Okay, what are the differences between those? What are the, how, how are those different? How are those similar in a brokerage account? Okay, um, what is required before you can have a margin account. Just just check what, for number two on the test, you wanna know what's required before you can have a margin account. Uh, make sure you know what it looks like to have a cash account. What, what is a cash account? How is it registered? What does it mean to have a cash account? Kind of similar to the last question about 
you know, if you know the difference between a cash account and margin account, the first three questions on the test will be, will be pretty easy. Uh, you want to know basic rules of margin investing. The test is going to try to try to test you on whether or not you know whether or not there are like minimums, for example, on margin investing. Uh, most accounts don't have minimums. Just keep that in mind. Uh, number five on the test, you're going to want to know the prudent man rule. The prudent man rule. What is the prudent, P-R-U-D-E-N-T, man rule? Prudent man rule before you get to the test. You're going to want to know how many types of IRAs there are. Okay, there are different kinds of individual retirement accounts. Uh, the text, the Series 7 text is going to tell you how many different types of IRAs there are, and you're going to want to know that before you get to the test. Uh, you're going to want to know what the, what the uh, rules are for investing in a traditional or Roth IRA. What are the rules? Okay, there's some rule about earned income versus passive income that's very important for number seven on the test. What are the rules as far as earned income or passive income for IRA investing? Okay, it's very specific. It's very easy. Once you find it, you'll have a note on it. And you'll get that one right. Uh, there's a there's a question on the test about what requirement there is for a broker dealer to send confirmations of trades. You'll want to know whether or not a broker dealer is obligated to send a confirmation of a trade to a client or not. Okay, is that an obligation or is it something that they don't have to do? Okay, that one's pretty, uh, yeah, intuitive, right? If you make a trade on somebody's account as a broker dealer, it would probably make sense that you have to confirm with the client that you did it. Okay, that's all I'll say on number eight. <laughs> number nine, uh, let's see here. Number nine is, is talking about the requirement of a broker dealer if somebody dies, okay? So you wanna check in series seven material on what a broker dealer is required to do if somebody passes away, okay? As soon as they find out about that person's passing, what is it, what is required on their part to do? Number 10 on the test. Number 10 on the test is false. Okay, number 11 on the test talks about whether or not we can use margin accounts for uh, IPOs. And once again, we referred to IPOs tonight. That's an initial public offering in the primary market. Can you use margin to do an IPO? Uh, make sure you understand that before you get to the test. Can we or can we not use margin accounts, which is basically borrowed money. That's what it means to be a margin account. It's borrowed money where you borrow money from the broker dealer can you use margin to invest in an IPO? Can you use margin accounts to invest in stocks that trade under $5 a share? Another question about margin accounts you'll want to know before you get to the test. Can you use a margin account to invest in a stock that trades below $5 a share? What does regulation T regulate? You'll want to know that for number 13 on the test. Regulation T as in the letter T. What does regulation T govern as far as what, 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 does it govern margin accounts? Does it govern cash accounts? Does it govern both? Do the rules apply to both those types of accounts? You wanna know that before you get to the test. You'll wanna know about the rules of margin again. So, I, boy, there's a lot of questions about margin on this, on this test. You'll wanna know um, how much can be borrowed when it comes to a margin account. Remember I told you that a margin account is a borrowed, is an account where you're borrowing money from the broker dealer so you can invest more than what your dollars would justify. So what are the rules on how much you can borrow from the broker dealer when you've got a margin account? How quickly must a cash trade settle? You'll wanna know that before you get to the test. How quickly does a trade in a brokerage account, so I'm, say I, I'm an investor and I trade it in my account, how fast does that trade have to settle? And what it means by settle is, is it trades and it comes into cash. So how fast does my trade have to come into cash? So if I'm a broker dealer, how fast do I have to make somebody's money go from an investment to cash? And I'll give you a hint, it's not immediate. 
It takes days, but how many days? You'll want to know that before you get to the test. Make sure you understand that the Fed, and remember we talked about the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve has a special power as far as margin. They're actually able to change the margin requirement for banks. Okay, so keep that in mind for the test. You'll want to know that the Fed has the right and the power to change the, the margin requirement. You'll want to know the margin rule 143. What is margin rule 143? And what is rule 431? How does it apply to margin accounts? So 143 and 431 are different margin rules. If you know the basics of each of them, you'll be just fine on those two. Make sure you understand uh, what short sales are. Short sales are when we basically buy against a stock, so we short it. That means we're banking on the stock going down, okay? And we're gonna benefit if the stock goes down. So when we hear about hedge fund managers and different investors shorting stock, or the movie called The Big Short, okay? is about shorting a position, meaning taking a bet against the position. So we'll benefit if it goes down. So if you see something that you really think is a bad investment and it's gonna go down, you could actually short it. You could invest against it, and that's called shorting. So a short sale, okay, cannot be done in a cash account. So keep that in mind for number 19. Where does a short sale have to be done? What kind of account does it have to be done? In? I just told you it couldn't be a cash account, and we've been talking about two different main account types, right? Margin accounts and cash accounts. So if it can't be done in a, in a cash account, which account can it be done in? You'll want to know that and have a note on that before you get to the test. You'll want to know before you get to the test what it means to short against the box. What does it mean to short against the box? Okay. What does it mean to short against the box? Uh, number 21 is, is another short question. Uh, let's see, actually 21, 22, and 23 are all questions about shorting a stock. Okay. So you'll wanna know, I would read up a little bit on how to calculate the benefit from shorting a stock. So if I short a stock and the, and the value goes down, right, then I'm going to benefit from that. And regulation T is going to dictate how much money I have to have in my account in order to short a stock. Okay, we talked about regulation T earlier. What does it apply to? How does it apply to margin accounts? What are the rules as far as margin accounts is concerned? Okay, we talked about how there's the 50% rule. You, you have to have... Regulation T dictates that in a margin account, you have to have 50% value. So if I want to short $500,000 worth of a stock, I have to have $250,000 because I, I can't short unless I have 50% equity. Does that make sense? That's regulation T. Okay, so you'll want to read up on regulation T and what it means to, to have 50% equity and why that rule exists so that you understand 21, 22, and 23 as far as calculations on you know, just, just simple examples, but how much would be required or how much would you gain by having these different investments on a short? Um, you'll want to know whether or not margin accounts, uh, we'll just want to know about shorts and margin accounts. Just, just know that you need to study up a little bit on and, and become familiar with the terms, you know, shorting a stock, and using a margin account and what that means and what the rules are when I go to, to short a stock, okay? Uh, we, I don't know that we talked about wash sales, but wash sales are a tax consideration where if you invest in a stock, if you sell it out to take a loss, right, for tax purposes, and then you reinvest within 30 days, it's, it, you're violating what's considered the wash, wash sale rule which means that if you repurchase the same position within 30 days, it, it, it eliminates your ability to take the loss, okay? So if you've sold something to take a loss and then you immediately reinvest back in, the federal government's not gonna allow you to, to take the loss. When it comes to short sales, okay, 
the federal government always looks at short sales as a wash sale. So you can't, there's, there's no taking losses on short sales. Okay, so keep that in mind for the test. You'll want to know that. You'll want to know what the plus tick rule is. What is the plus tick? P-L-U-S-T-I-C-K, plus tick rule, okay, for short sellers. What is that? And that will answer both 26 and 27, both about what the plus tick rule is. Then we've got a matching question, number 28, your favorite, Michelle. Here are the terms that you'll need to, to have a basic understanding on. Commission, markup, broker's call loan, 12B1, okay, these are all different terms, 12B1 fees, Broker, I'm, I'm repeating myself now, broker's call loan, just in case you didn't get it, markup, commission, those were the different definitions, here's some more, load, okay, what is a load, what are rights of accumulation, what is a letter of intent, what are mortality and expense risk charges, what are surrender charges, wrap fees, hedge funds, and private equity. So that's a beast. As far as matching questions are concerned, there's a lot of definitions there. In some ways, when you have a lot of definitions like that, they, they are, oh, they're actually a little bit easier in some ways because you, you have so many different definitions that it's pretty easy to find the right one, right? Because these things, most of these definitions are going to be pretty different. Um, there, there's not much similarity between, for example, mortality and expense risk charges and hedge funds, right? Those are just very different concepts, very different things. However, the difference between hedge funds and private equity, those are pretty, those have some similarities. So you'll need to know what's different about those two. And the difference between uh, rights of accumulation and a letter of intent, okay, those are more similar. So we'll want to know the difference between those two. You want to know the difference between wrap fees and surrender charges, right? Both costs, but a little bit different in what they're doing, okay? So if you didn't get that list, you can ob obviously you can replay this session and, and get down the list of all these terms, and, uh, and you'll be in good shape. Number 29 on the test. Um, Number 29 on the test talks about like civil or um, like if you're an advisor and you have some kind of criminal conviction against you, we need, we want to know whether or not the test wants you to know whether or not that could change your ability to be in this business as an investment advisor. So let's say you get put in prison for 10 years. Obviously it'd make it kind of hard to, to sell investments, but let's say that's not what happened. You got caught for fraud and there's a criminal investigation in, that you are proven guilty on for fraud uh, of some kind. Does that impact your ability to be an investment advisor? Okay, and I think what you're thinking right now is probably the right answer, but just verify that before you get to the test, okay? Next question on the test just asks, if you have a bankruptcy, does that change your supervision uh, potentially, the supervision that you receive, the regulation and supervision that you receive in this business, okay, if you have a personal bankruptcy. Uh, once again, just before you get to the test, just know whether or not a bankruptcy can change your supervision that you receive within this business. Uh, make sure you understand outside business activities. If you're a practicing advisor, what does it mean to have an outside business activity and how does it affect what you do and is it mandatory to uh, disclose it? So let me tell you, it is mandatory to disclose outside business activities, even if they're not related to what you're doing. So for example, for my day job, I work for Zions Bank as a financial advisor, financial planner. I also teach night classes like I'm doing right now for Stevens Henniger or Independence U. By law, I have to report to my, um, to my company, to Zions, that I teach these classes. Even though I'm not trying to sell anybody in these classes any kind of investments, it's, it doesn't have any kind of conflict of interest necessarily. 
it just always has to be disclosed. They require all or any outside business activities to be disclosed and approved in order for you to, to, to be um, compliant. If somebody were to find that you have an outside business activity that you had hidden from your employer, that's, that's grounds to, to get fired. Okay, they take it that seriously. So outside business activities, you want to understand the basics of outside business activities before you get to the test and whether or not you have to disclose those types of things. Um, make sure you know about disclosure. So number 32 on the test is a question that just basically asks you, do you have to disclose different things, different basic pieces of information to a customer? And of course, the answer is yes. You have to disclose basic information to a customer. Okay. So there's number 32 for you. Number 33 and 34 are pretty intuitive. They talk about, you know, interactions with a customer, trying to, as we've talked about many times, uh, ascertain or, or um get enough information through fact finding to make sure that you do something suitable for your customer, right? So they're pretty intuitive. Uh, number 35 talks about, you know, we, how it's important to know about financials. Okay. Whenever you see on the test though, like an absolute, like only this way or um, the only possible outcome is this or something like that, just be careful because the answer might be one of the, one of the right things associated with whatever it's asking about. But when it uses words like only, you know, then it's eliminating everything else. And of course, then the answer would be false or true, depending on how it asks the question. But, but when it speaks in absolutes, just be careful. Test questions that, that talk in absolutes, you need to be very careful and reread the question a few times to make sure that you understand what it's asking about. And if it's saying, if it's, if it's eliminating all other options and you know there are some other op options that would be applicable to whatever it's asking about, then, you know, the answer's wrong, even though it's hard to explain. But even though that, like, it's like saying uh, bananas are the only fruit, okay? Are bananas the only fruit? Of course not, right? There are lots of other fruits, so that would be false. Even though bananas are a fruit, they're not the only fruit, okay? That's, that's kind of the, the idea on number 35 on the test that they're trying to trick you a little bit um, by giving you an example that is relevant, but it's not the only relevant option. Okay, so just maybe put a star by that one to make sure and, and watch out for 35 uh, and reread read the question. Number 36 talks about, you know, how it might make sense to look at a balance sheet, obviously for, an, you know, before we go into investing for somebody or give people investment advice, of course. And then we get back to a matching question, but this one, Michelle, is very short. We've just got three, uh, three things to match. Uh, the terms are accumulation, consolidation, and spending. So those three were accumulation, consolidation, and spending. Okay? So those are the three for number 37, a matching question. Okay. We're going to go over time by about five minutes, so bear with me here. Uh, you're you're welcome to to you know get off the off the session if you need to, Michelle or Jack, and just listen to the recording later if you if you if you need to to get the notes. But we're going to try to get through as much of it as we can. Thirty eight on the test. Uh, 38 on the test is just a suitability question. Whenever the test asks you whether or not it's important to find certain information. Uh, just default always on the side of yes, it's important to find out as much information as we possibly can. So if it asks you a specific question about, hey, is it important to know about like a person's family situation? Of course it is, right? Yes. If it's, is it important to know about their job situation? Is it important to know about their goals or aspirations or future or inheritance or, you know, the fact that they just won the lottery? All those things, you know, and those aren't all test questions, right? But, but just Default on the side of more information is good when it comes to collecting information for a client because you want to know as much as you possibly can find out in order to do the right thing for a client. Okay. You'll want to know the types of, of issues that affect somebody's risk tolerance. Okay. The types of issues that the Series 7 test talks about in, the, in Investopedia, what types of issues affect somebody's risk tolerance? 
you'll want to know what the book has to say, uh, what the text has to say about what are the four basic investment objectives. Okay. What are the four basic investment objectives? We talked about two of them quite a bit. We talked about growth and income, right? We talked about how somebody could want to grow their money or somebody could want to have just income, you know, and that, that be their focus. Those are the two main objectives that 99% of people out there have. But make sure before you get to the test, you know the other two. Uh, the other two that Investopedia talks about within the Series 7 information for number 40 on the test. Number 41 on the test talks about diversification, the importance of diversification. Just make sure you understand what the, the book has to say about diversification. Um, why is it important? Why is it good? Uh, make sure you know about the risk reward trade-off. When people take on risk, it doesn't mean that they're going to get paid commensurate for that risk. In fact, there are a lot of really stupid investments out there where you take a lot of risk and there's not even that much potential for a reward, right? In a good investment, the more risk we take, the more we should get rewarded, but that's not always the case. And just keep that in mind. Keep in mind risk reward and that trade off um, for number 42 on the test and you'll be in good shape. Number 43 on the test is a, is a, matching, a matching problem. The terms that you'll need to know are the put call ratio Okay, what is the put call ratio, market momentum, and trading volume? Okay, if you read through those before you get to the test, that will be a really easy matching question because those are very, very different definitions. Okay, so just try to get the concept though once again. Don't, don't just memorize a definition or read through it and just say whatever. I'll find it when I get to the test again. I, I would really try to understand those concepts because then when you get to the test, it'll be so easy. The, the definitions will just be glowingly different, right, if you understand the concepts. If you don't understand the concepts, all the definitions will look similar, right, and, and trick you a little bit. But if you've already gone through those concepts and really have, a, have at least in concept, in theory, you understand basically what they're talking about, you'll be in great shape. 44 on the test is about indexes. So what is an index when we talk about the stock market? The S&P 500 is an index. The Russell 3000 is an index. What are indexes? How do we use them? Number 45 on the test talks about the concept of technical analysis. Okay, technical analysis. Remember the difference between fundamental analysis and technical analysis. Technical analysis, remember, was about charts, right? Momentum and looking at a chart and trying to determine the, the direction of a stock and its value. Fundamental analysis was, was you look at the fundamentals of the company, the financials and things like that, and then try to determine the stock value from that. So if you know the difference between fundamental and technical analysis, you'll have number 45 on the test right. Number 46 on the test asks you about what generally accepted accounting principles are the most important to consider for the Series 7 exam, which of course would just be the opinion of Investopedia. So Go to Investopedia and find out what it has to say about the five most important generally accepting accounting principles. Tonight we talked about uh, depreciation, right? Which was we know is an important one. And we talked about LIFO and FIFO, which is valuing inventories. Um, but there are some others. So just make sure you know uh, the five and you'll be in good shape. Number 47 on the test, definition of depreciation, and you'll get that one right. Number 48, uh, you'll want to know the, the, the calcul the, how, you, how to calculate working capital, okay? So what is working capital? What is, it's a really simple formula, right? If, if you're finding a big formula, you don't want, you know, you're in the wrong place. In Investopedia under the Series 7 information, how do you calculate working capital? It's one thing minus another, okay? So really straightforward, just make sure you know what it is before you get to the test. How do you calculate the quick ratio? The quick ratio, you wanna, you wanna know or at least be able to find the formula for the quick ratio. If it were me, I'd just write it down in my notes before I got to the test because you know you're gonna be tested on that. Uh, the next one is how does the Series 7 test material tell you to calculate the risk for bankruptcy. How do you calculate the risk for bankruptcy? So you take a company 
and you're dealing with financial numbers for that company, how do you calculate its risk for bankruptcy? And another way of saying that is how do you calculate the debt to equity ratio? The debt to equity ratio. So if you just have a quick formula for that, you'll be in great shape for the test. 51, another formula. I don't know why they're doing this. I'm going to have to talk to the folks who made this test. It's crazy. Uh, you're going to want to know the formula for the inventory turnover ratio for number 51. For number 52, you're going to want to know the formula for calculating cash flow. Okay. How do you calculate cash flow? Number 53, earnings per common share, EPS. What's the formula for that? Number 54, the price earnings ratio. What's the formula for the price earnings for, uh, ratio? Number 55, the formula for calculating gross margin. How do you calculate gross margin? Number 56, a very long uh, matching question, which is frustrating because it's at the very end of the test. You'll think you're almost done, and then you've got a long matching question. So let's give you the terms. Market, limit, stop, stop limit, day, good till canceled. Okay, and actually that'll be, I know I've said this before, but the, those terms are, once again, enough different that it should be a pretty straightforward matching question. They're just ways that you can execute a trade in a brokerage account. Okay, those are all different ways that you can execute a trade in a brokerage account. So if you just familiarize yourself with kind of the basic differences between those, you'll be in great shape for that one. Actually, number 57 is another matching. Also about trade, I just thought that was all one, so I apologize, I told you I had one more, there are two more. 57 is more trade lingo. Uh, one is all or none, one is fill or kill, one is immediate or cancel, and one is not held. Okay, those are all four of those are terminology for once again trading stocks. Okay. And number 58 on the test is six. Okay, six years. Number 58 on the test is six years. Okay, all right, that's a lot of material. I apologize, went over by a little bit, but I wanted to make sure you've got all the topics that are going to be on there so that you can prepare yourself and feel comfortable that you know at least what's going to be on there. Now it's up to you. You know, this is early in the week. It's up to you now to put in the time and effort if you if you want a really good score on the test to, to go through those topics and make sure that you feel comfortable with them. Uh, at least, like I say, don't don't worry about digging really deep on them all, but just make sure that you that conceptually you just you familiarize yourself with the concept a little bit using this link on Investopedia, you know, and that outline on Investopedia on those different topics that you know will be on the test. Okay. All right. So that's it. Good luck this week with the test. You guys can all do very well on it uh, if you put in a little bit of preparation and make sure that you give yourself enough time. Any other questions or concerns before we wrap up tonight? Michelle, Jack, still awake? That review probably put you to sleep. Um, I will potentially do a curve if, if we have an average score like we did on the, on the week two exam. Okay? But just, I, you know, since it's a final exam, you won't even know until after you take it, right? So just treat it like it's not going to be curved and do your very best, put in lots of effort, and then, and then if I need to, I will. Okay? I don't want this class to be so hard that you can't get the grade that you want. I'll, I'll make sure that you get the, you know, that people who put in sufficient effort get a good grade in this class. And if that means that I have to, to, to add some points to the final exam as well, we'll look at it. Okay. All right. Have a good evening. Like I say, good luck on the test. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns as you prepare. And please, if you're listening to this and you're missing some work, check through all your grades and get everything completed this week uh, by Saturday. Okay. All righty. Have a good night. I'm going to turn off the recording and then Michelle, if you've got any questions, Jack, if you've got any questions, we can continue uh, as long as we need to.